Managing Director and Regional Trust Executive of U.S. Trust at Bank of America's Private Wealth Management, and a Director of the World Affairs Council uh, of Philadelphia. Uh, before we begin the program, uh, we're going to ask everybody to please silence your cell phones and any other electronic devices. And we are, however, happy to have anyone who feels so inclined to uh, tweet from tonight's program. Now, honestly, I don't even really know what that means. <laughs> so, uh, we would like to welcome you all and take a moment to tell you about an exciting lineup of events uh, for the upcoming months. On March 15th, we'll be continuing our Eye on the Economy series with the Inquirer business columnist Bill Dunkelberg and Wharton business professor Justin Wolfers on the timely topic of the employment forecast and consumer sentiment. And then on April 17th, we're really excited and honored to present the Right Honorable Tony Blair with our International Statesman Award. This will truly be a once-in-a-lifetime event in the magnificent ball, ballroom at the Hyatt at the Bellevue, where we're now able to offer additional seating. Then on May 15th, Deirdre Connolly, president of North American Pharmaceuticals at GlaxoSmithKline, and Bloomberg News uh, executive editor Amanda Bennett will join us for the third part in our Eye on the Economy series to discuss doing business in the 21st century. And finally, we've just received great news. Mark Grossman, the special representative to Afghanistan and Pakistan, will join us on May 23rd, one day after he participates uh, in the NATO summit in Chicago. Ambassador Grossman will be followed by a panel of experts who will continue the discussion of President Obama's foreign policy, which is uh, certain to be of interest to our followers of international affairs. So it's quite an exciting season, and so for more information about these and other programs, please check out our website and uh, our most recent newsletter, which is uh, also can be found out on the uh, registration table. So these events, along with the support of our members and partners, uh, enable the Council to offer its most important programs to a diverse group of over 2,100 middle and high school students. Uh, in 80 schools throughout the Philadelphia area, fostering the skills and sensibilities they will need in order to thrive and compete in a knowledge-based global community. And now I'm delighted to introduce tonight's speakers. An Edward Weintel Prize winner for international journalism, Philadelphia Inquirer columnist Trudy Rubin is known for her extensive coverage of global issues. In the last seven years, Rubin has journeyed to Iraq 11 times, visited Afghanistan and Pakistan four times, and has reported extensively from China, Turkey, and the Israel-Palestine region. The author of Willful Blindness, the Bush Administration and Iraq, and a 2001 Pulitzer Prize finalist for her commentary. Ms. Rubin was awarded the Arthur Ross Award for International Commentary, from the Academy of American Diplomacy in 2010. Her column, World View, runs every Thursday and Sunday in the Philadelphia Inquirer. Joining Trudy Rubin is Marwan Bashara, senior political analyst for Algeria, Al Jazeera English. As a renowned author in global politics, Mr. Bashara has established himself as one of the leading authorities in international, U.S., and Middle Eastern policy. He's the editor and host of Al Jazeera English's flagship show, Empire, a program that examines the agendas of various global powers. He was previously a lecturer of international relations at the American University of Paris and has had, and has had his writings appear in the New York Times, International uh, Herald Tribune, Washington Post, and Newsweek, in addition to many other well-known publications and outlets. His newest book, The Invisible Arab, The Promise and Peril of the Arab Revolution, is available here tonight. And Mr. Bashar has uh, kindly agreed to sign copies uh, following tonight's program. So please join me in welcoming Trudy Rubin and Marlon Bashar.
designated hitter if I can get my mic turned on. You're on. Am I on? Can you yes. Yes, you're on. Uh, on? Oh, okay. That was easy. Um, I'm going to apologize in advance. My brain is a little bit of mush because I have a horrible head cold. So if I'm a little bit incoherent, that's my excuse. <coughs> but um, since we're starting with just a few minutes each of conversation, I thought that what I would talk about is just how um, I'm trying to look at what's been happening in the Arab Spring and autumn and winter now, as opposed to how I was looking at it uh, in February when I was in Egypt um, at, uh, at the Tahrir Square Revolution. It's not a... No, it's not working. I, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, I'll just hold it. Uh, <laughs> hold on. Let me get a swig. <laughs> All right, uh, we will try again. Uh, I just wanted to talk. <laughs> revolts, rebellions, at this point, uh, compared to how I was looking at them when I was in Egypt in February, and then again in October and November when I was in Tunisia for the elections, the first democratic elections, and then back in Egypt just before the parliamentary elections started <coughs> there. <coughs> One of the things that fascinates me is that I think there are several different rebellions and revolutions going on, uh, not just one. Uh, it, back in January, February uh, in Egypt, and I wasn't in Tunis uh, when that outbreak happened, but in Egypt, the initial uh, upheaval, the the organizers, such as they were, I have decided that I sort of see them in one category. And then the people who came in, who followed them, whether they were the soccer players, whether they were ordinary working people who flocked to the square, uh, whether they were a broad mass of Egyptians who felt some sympathy with what was going on, um, I'm beginning to see in another category. The overarching word that I've decided that fits the whole revolution the best is the word dignity rather than the word democracy. Um, because it seemed to me that the common thread between the educated young people, uh, some in their 30s who were using Facebook and so forth, um, and the, the larger uh, hinterland was this frustration that they were being treated like mules. And, you know, it's interesting because you hear the same word used by Russians, a totally different kind of country, but I've been on the phone a lot um, to Moscow because I'm going next week uh, for the Putin reincarnation um, <laughs> uh, or re re thefting. Um, and, I mean, again, the word in Egypt, people used, were saying to me when I'd go to working class areas in February and again in October, and then again in November, I was there twice, um, they talked about uh, being treated like mules. Uh, in uh, Russia, they talk about being treated like cows. I don't know what the difference is here, but, but the point is the same, being treated like animals. Uh, we might say sheep. And it was this um, desire to hold one's head up 
uh, to have pride in one's country that I think is the unifying factor. I think that the, the educated people, and I talked with most of the leadership in the um, council that formed after January 25th and even before January 25th, um, trying to organize these demonstrations, there were people who were thinking in more concrete political terms, thinking in terms of democracy. Many of them had been involved for quite some time. Uh, as you may know, there were opposition groups, civil society groups, uh, that had been operating since 2005, uh, some of them in some form or another even before. I was in Cairo in 2005 when there were pro-democracy demonstrations, but at that time, uh, the people on the streets were outnumbered by the police with Darth Vader helmets and shields and were very badly treated. Uh, and back in 2005, you also had judges involved. Uh, you had nascent civil society groups. You had women, but small numbers. Uh, people had learned from that. People had taken up the Facebook method of organization. And, and there were young people, people who had been outside Egypt, people who were very aware of the outside world, and they were thinking in terms of democracy, institutions, parliament, change, governance. Um, but what drew larger numbers of people to the square was this concept of dignity standing up over and over again. I had people tell me, uh, one taxi driver that I wound up hiring and I went with him to Fustat, uh, a working class, very old district where he lived and met all his friends from the coffee house. And what they talked about was that they had given up on Egypt. That's the word he said, given up on. He said, I thought nothing would ever change. He said, my wife used to yell at me for throwing garbage out of the window of my cab. But I said, what difference did it make? And then he showed me a plastic bag that he had on the floor. He said, now I put everything in there because now Egypt is my country again. Uh, and so, people felt for the first time that they had a voice, a voice. They weren't thinking so much of a system, they were thinking of a voice and hoping that somehow having that voice would translate into better living standards, maybe too much expectation, definitely too much expectation, that something would change, but not thinking systemically. And this is one of the things that I've been noodling on a lot uh, as uh, uh, spring has turned to fall and, and fall has turned to winter. Um, where is the systemic thinking? I think that, again, the young people, the organizers, were trying to look ahead. But as we have seen and as was somewhat apparent at the beginning, they were not capable of thinking in terms of political organization. They were excellent at thinking in terms of street organization and demonstrations. But when it came to thinking in terms of political parties, it was much harder for them. And it was also hard for them to come up with a message that resonated among the wider public at large. Now, where do the Islamists fit into this picture? And I think that's one of the most interesting questions. Because while the ordinary working class people, I think, were thinking of dignity, and the educated young people were thinking of democracy, I think the Muslim Brotherhood, which has been working uh, in Egypt, both underground and above ground for many years, which was able to elect people to parliament on an individual basis, but was banned as a party, I think what the Brotherhood was thinking about mostly was, my God, is there a chance to come to power? Um, because the Brotherhood had an ideology long honed. They had an organizational structure long honed and very, very disciplined. So the question was now, could they spring into action? But in a way, the Brotherhood's ideology is an old ideology. Um, I mean, it's an ideology that was developed uh, in the 20th century, um, uh, uh, grown in the 20th century. And what's fascinating to me is that the Younger Brotherhood um, uh, men who broke off from their seniors were impatient with that ideology because it was a top-down control ideology where older men controlled the younger generation and didn't want to hear any fresh ideas. 
This is apart from the question of religion or not religion. It was an old organization with, in a way, a constipated organizational structure and it didn't seem to fit the new times. Um, it then came the Salafis, the Salafi Islamists. So where did they fit into the picture? They weren't thinking about democracy at all. They have disdained it. They think it's a corrupt system. But suddenly they saw it as a vehicle to power. And they are thinking of religious goals. So you had, I think, a Muslim Brotherhood interest in power, Salafis fascinated by the idea that they could say anything, do anything, and maybe have the power to bring religiosity to the country. Young educated people thinking of democratic institutions, and a large massive number of people thinking of dignity and a better standard of life, a government that was responsible to them and less corruption but impatient with disorder. So how does that add up into something that you can describe as a pattern, an ideology, um, uh, something that leads in a certain direction? Uh, that indeed is the question. And you know, I'm not even going to, at this point, although I'm happy to, in question, uh, in question time, get into um, the other rebellions that have been proceeding uh, by force, whether it's Libya, where we basically didn't have a country, um, and we just had a leadership with a people, and no institutions whatsoever. So a country that's starting from scratch to try to build a political system. And Syria, a country where nobody knows what will emerge after Bashar al-Assad, but I haven't been in Syria for a long time, but the last time I was there in 2005, and I talked to all the heads of, of it seemed like just about every head of a small opposition group, and most of whom admitted freely that they and their membership could probably fit in, say, a room twice this size. Most of them told me that the only force that had organization in Syria was in the mosque. So where those countries will go, I think, is a whole broader subject. But what I'm interested in is where the countries with more structure will go. Is anyone in a position to lead these countries towards a, a specific new structure of governance that will respond to the desires of the people? And <coughs> frankly, when I look at Egypt, I don't see the, I, the idea men and women. I heard a lot of terrific ideas from young people in February, but they were new to this game. They don't know how to relate to their own hinterland, and they don't know how to organize to get those ideas out to the vast mass of the people. I think some of those ideas about democracy could resonate, because democracy does fit with dignity, in theory, in theory, it does fit with less corrupt governance, but you have to be able to talk to the people. When I met these Facebook kids, I thought they would be better at it. I thought they would be able to organize out in the countryside. They talked about doing that, but they didn't. So where are the new ideas? Um, and I'll just mention briefly where the only place I see them so far, Marwan may, may see many more elsewhere, but the, the place that I think is fascinating is the place to watch is Tunisia. And the reason I say that is because I think in Tunisia you do have thinkers who are in power. And the problem is that these thinkers happen to be fairly well along in years. Um, even though I think they have new ideas, they're old in years, and I don't know whether they can carry all of their followers behind them. I'm referring to the leaders of Tunisia's victorious Islamist party, Ennahda. Um, now, Rashid Ghanouchi, uh, the titular head of the party, and um, uh, Mr. Jabali, uh, who is now the prime minister, was the secretary general of the party, they lived in exile for many years. Now, living in exile doesn't guarantee anything. Uh, you know, I think there's a lot of political leaders of various stripes who've lived in exile, <coughs> including people like the Dawa party, now uh, ruling in Iraq. 
who didn't gain much from their years in exile um, uh, in terms of broadening their thinking. But I think that um, uh, Ganucci is a very unusual person, I believe, in that I think he looked around and he understood that in order to move forward, parties with Islamist roots must look to the greater world and must relate to it. That trying to um, create a political uh, philosophy <coughs> that bases itself on opposition to the West, but not on positively creating something new, is a loser. And so I see this kind of thinking uh, in Ganucci and in the leadership of Anada, trying to meld Islamism with an economy that reaches out to the West and creates jobs, with a mobility for people within the party, uh, but whether he will be able to control his own people, whether things develop that way, I can't say. But that's where I see the forward thinking, in part inspired by um, uh, Turkey, and, and, and Turkey's party with Islamic roots, which is ruling AK Party. Uh, when Turkey's uh, leader, Prime Minister Erdogan, went to Cairo, uh, he was welcomed by the Muslim Brothers and then basically rejected because he talked about a secular state but Muslim values. I think that uh, Enada in Tunisia is working on that concept, and I think they are the place to watch. But whether other countries in the region will adopt that thinking, I don't know. So we have a desire for dignity, democracy a question mark, um, uh, and what kind of political philosophy will come to dominate uh, these rebellions, too early to say. And I'll stop there. <coughs> Thank you, Trudy. Uh, well, I guess uh, Trudy has made my my job a bit more difficult tonight, <laughs> which is okay. Um, I will try and start from where Trudy left off. I just came back from uh, Tunisia, and I actually sat down for an hour with Mr. Anushi, the head of the Islamist Party, and I sat down for another hour, separate, with the president of Tunisia, <coughs> Mousaf al Um and indeed, they are very uh, interesting leaders, slash characters, slash former opposition, slash exile. Um, Tunisians. Um, Mr. Marzouk is a secular leader, sort of left of center. Mr. Uh, Ranushi is a sort of a centrist conservative religious. Um, they have a sort of, a, they arrived to some sort of an understanding, not an agreement, an understanding, whereby they divided the parliament, uh, the presidency, and uh, the premiership among the three leading parties. And uh, Mr. 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 Uh, Musa Murzuki became uh, President in that in that form, and it's, it's a very interesting character. And why I say that because um, for a lot of us, especially living in this part of the world, sort of west of the Mediterranean, um, don't know such characters. They were invisible, as the title of my book would have it. They were invisible to the rest of the world um, as as early as 1970. Mr. Marzuki won, uh, uh, won uh, uh, um, it's called an internship, if you will, uh, to go for one year to India to study nonviolent action back in 1970. Uh, before, for example, the guru of nonviolent action in Boston came to existence in the mid 80s, something like two decades before that. Those people who were quite invisible and since, in the case of Mr. Uh, Marzuki, now the unlikely president uh, of Tunisia, have, in, have been working at the fore of um, civil liberties, um, human rights, and so on and so forth, for four decades or so. Mr. Ghanoush is also quite similar. And what Mr. Ghanoush told me is that he is more than 
excited to work with Mr. Marzuki, that he's known for a long time in exile, and that they understand what does it mean to be at the receiving end of use, misuse, and abuse of power. And that the, 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 the Tunisia that they envision will be quite different from the Tunisia that, that was ruled before, and that human rights would be at its core, and that they would work both together for a civic constitution, and that they both committed democracy. Mr. Marzuki, when it came to the questions of foreign affairs, and I asked him point blank, I said, Mr. Marzuki, what about the relationship with the United States? Shall I leave the answer to the end of my uh, language? <laughs> <laughs> I could leave you up in suspense. <laughs> Actually, he answered what I, I've known him for a long time, and I, I, he answered the way I would expect him to answer. In dignity. He said, so it's not the people only that are looking for dignity, it's Arab leaders who are looking for dignity. He said, I'm looking, for, I'm looking forward to better relations with the United States, but as partners, not as clients. We would like to be dealt with, with respect. We don't want to be dictated to. We don't want to be simply at the forefront of some kind of a crusade on terror of some sort. We would like to be treated on mutual respect and mutual interest, something that indeed President Obama mentioned three years ago. I don't know what happened to it, but I know he mentioned it three years ago. Interestingly also, that Mr. Hanushi, and that I knew about him because I'm very familiar with his writing, uh, and here I, let me, just for the sake of excitement tonight, disagree with Trude a little bit since she's pouring water. <laughs> and um, to say the following, indeed, he was inspiring to the Akbar in Turkey, rather than the other way around. His writings were picked up by Erdogan in Turkey and the Ak Party activists as a new way of looking at what political Islam can offer and how it can adapt itself to the modern civic state. So indeed, uh, uh, Mr. Ghanoushi was part of what we referred then at the time in the early 90s as Second Islamic International. Basically, they were what Christian Democrats were in the early part of the 20th century. Just like we had Christian Democrats now, we have a new wave of uh, Muslim Democrats. And that's a very interesting phenomenon, and that tells us a lot about that perhaps here in this country, in mainstream media and academia, we should stop talking about Islam as some kind of a fixture in a museum, and maybe stop talking about Muslims and how Muslims evolve with their religion. And that not everything is a sixth or seventh century phenomenon, but that indeed, like Christians evolved over years and went through their zigzags from crusades to uh, religious wars and so on and so forth, and arriving to what we, are, what we are today, that also Muslims are capable of willing to also, to also do the same thing. That was the spring. But yes, as Trudy said, this has been, or that's evolved into uh, a revolution for all seasons. And today, uh, coming here, I, I, I had an espresso across the street in this wonderful dome uh, at uh, Ritz Carlton. And I picked up, the, of course, the Philadelphia Inquirer. <laughs> and uh, the, the, the international news page was from the Middle East, from the Arab world, and you had two stories juxtaposition one next to the other. One was about Yemen and how there's a presidential election there, and you can tell from the, the mood in the article that this is more or less packaged, you know, all Yemen, but perhaps with new possibilities. And on the right, there was the article about Syria, with, of course, the bloodshed in Homs and the bloodshed in the country and the escalation to violence and the possibility of Syria. So that, if you were sort of the other side of the Arab revolution, a sense of despair, a sense of escalation to violence, a sense of that things are getting out of hand, that the, that the dream of freedom, democracy of January, 2011 has turned to the nightmare of war and violence in January 2012. And to a certain degree, yes, we've been seeing, we've been looking, we've been watching uh, certain 
uh, setbacks in a number of countries. Uh, things have, got, have gotten complicated in Libya. Uh, slow transition in Yemen. God knows how long it's going to take. Certainly complications in Egypt and, uh, and Tunisia. Yesterday's USA Today, I was talking about in a radio show, basically says this is a doomed, forget it. Egypt is just history. It's just Islamists and generals, and there's no point. Um, certainly the question of Bahrain is also something to be looked at, something where the revolution was tamed by uh, the royal family there with, uh, with the help of uh, the regional players and, and so on and so forth. So this has evolved into a revolution of all systems. And yes, it is specific to each and every country, to each and every society. And while it is perhaps more smoother in the questions of Tunisia and Egypt, it is more complicated in the question of Syria and Libya. But that as far as the specificities goes, I am actually more interested in the generality. And what is in common among all of those, and why is this interesting? First of all, how come it's all Arab? Why what started in Tunisia went to Egypt, and went straight into Libya, Syria, Yemen, and to Bahrain, and so on and so forth? Why is it Arab? Why did it go elsewhere? So what is so, what is so collective about this? Is it just the Arabic language living under Arabic sky? Is there something more to it? Is there a certain political grammar that we need to know about, about the Arabs in that part of the world? That's one, ask, one question I ask in the book I try to answer. The other question is, what, what is the theme that could be looked at and that is beyond what happens on every Friday's prayers or after every Friday's prayers? Or every newspaper's headline every day or every other day? What is, what is more historic? And, this and for me, there are a number of things to be looked at. And I think, honestly, these are the serious things. These are the important things to look at. Because things will keep swinging and they will keep zigzagging in the, in the immediate and intermediate future. I think what we have there, perhaps upheavals here, civil war there, and uprisings in the other place. But what we had across the board is a revolution of consciousness. There is a revolution in the sense that people have broken with the past. <coughs> even in countries where change has not even uh, uh, showed up in any form or, or shape, I think it's coming. Because there's something happening across the region from Morocco to Iraq, where people now know what is their value, what they are capable of, and how they could go about doing it. And, and, and this is not going to be stopped. And it's just a matter of time in some countries. In other countries it was easier, in some countries it's more complicated. But even in countries where it's so complicated, as in Syria, where people go out to demonstrate knowing they will die, they are going to demonstrate in bigger numbers, in greater numbers. Once deterrence doesn't work, it loses half of its value. Once then force is used, and excessive force is used, and still people go out in bigger numbers, that means it's just a question of time for regimes to lose. Even in the most deadliest of situations, as for example, that we see. So across the board, we have a break with the past. What we also have is a break with fear. Break with fear. This country, this, this region, was all about fear. Dictatorship, and deterrence, torture, and exile, imprisonment, and and, uh, and 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 day to day repression was all about instilling fear in people's hearts. People have broken the barrier of fear. No longer are people afraid in that part of the world to speak their minds, to accept themselves to do whatever needs to be done, and even in places where it's still hesitant, I think it's just a question. <coughs> so there's a number of phenomena like that that I think happen across the board. Now, as this happens, of course, those who have been there over the last several decades, either resisting or struggling or, or sat in prison for decades or had something to say in the poor neighborhoods 
or in the local mosque or church for that matter, of course now they are coming out and what we're seeing today are those who have been invisible to us for all, this, for all, for all these decades. And what they have to say sometimes is not that coherent. I was asked about that from, by a radio show from Denver. I said, but this is not liberal democracy. Okay, it's not. It's not, by the way, I mean, I agree. I mean, if you lived in the United States for the last 200 years, you know, some of the discourse coming out of there is not, doesn't sound like it is, uh, you know, Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> and that was constitutional democracy, not even liberal democracy. But projecting on a revolution that is going on in the Arab world through some sort of set values is problematic. And here, let me sort of wind it down and end with just a quick note for you to, for maybe perhaps to open the discussion. Uh, as I, as, as I've uh, come here to the, to, 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 uh, to the states from, <coughs> from the region, I have that face that whenever I get onto an airplane, people ask me to evaluate the flight. I think they're going to get good grades for some reason. Or I'm, I look like the ones who can actually get the long form and fill it. And, so. and actually, I took a 15-hour flight this time. And I was, as usual, asked, you know, would you like to fill in? Uh, is this creep? I don't know what, etc. I said, yeah, of course, you know. What's new? And it's very simple. They ask you point of departure, point of arrival. Are there stopovers? Is it convenient? How is the service? How is the security? Have there been delays? Was it your expectations? Maybe even how is the food? You feel it. It's good, bad, ugly or something. Good, bad, and best. Part. That is not how you create a revolution. <laughs> And that's the only thing I've been hearing for last year. People are wondering, where did this come from exactly? What day did this? I mean, where is the point of departure? So where is the point of arrival? Liberal democracy, Denver style, or libertarian democracy, Denver style. And why, why haven't we arrived there in February 11, and now it's already February 2012? Why aren't they there? It wasn't really convenient. It was too rocky, perhaps. The food isn't great, you know, indeed. We're having corn in the Hebrew Square. Uh, the service certainly, you know, hasn't been great. All the coverage, and, and so so. You got, you got my point. Revolutions could not be judged with certain projection, with certain clinical, certain sterile way. Certainly not by projecting whatever we have in terms of fantasies, whether here or elsewhere, about what should or could happen. I think it's miraculous what happened. That we, have a, we have a miracle generation now in that part of the world. Against all odds, those, who, those, those among us here in the East Coast who keep talking about the young generation of Arabs have as the reservoir of extremism, as a demographic threat, a burden on the world economy, on our shores. They're all you know, creeping, migrating, sort of uh, 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 destabilizing our demogra demogra demography and education system and so, so forth. That new, that new generation of Arabs proved to have more interesting ideas than their elders, proved to be better connected, more cosmopolitan, better universal, more, more in touch with the universal values, universal rights, certainly had better balcony to look at the outside world than their elders, had more courage, and they prove to be quite an asset, not a burden. They are the promise. They are the things to build on. Men and women, girls and boys. And I think in a sense, we will continue to live the nightmares of everyday Syria, Yemen, ups and downs, more violence, less democracy, Islam is taking over here, self is speaking out loud there. But I think when you look across the board, on the overall, there is reason to be optimistic. That doesn't mean we lose our balance, doesn't mean our feet are not in the ground. But it's okay, you know, every once in a while, just to be happy about something before getting depressed about it. <laughs> Thank you very much for your
We're going to uh, open it up for some uh, Q and A for about 15, 15 minutes, twenty minutes. Does that does that work? We're going until 7.15. So, yeah. Okay, until 7.15? Okay. That's 30 um, so we're a little microphone deficient, so we'll just do hands up, and if you could just uh, ask your question loudly, the gentleman uh, both, right there. Both of you talk about the dignity of the Arab leaders and the dignity of the Arab people at this point in their house of the revolution, and you also mentioned how they're not yet quite organized, and yet there are a lot of Western NGOs over there, and they're running into a lot of problems and yet those NGOs do know how to organize. And I just wonder how the Western civilization can help without getting themselves in too much trouble. Yeah. Um, you know, I think, I think this is really a very, very interesting question. I mean, especially if you look at what's happening in Egypt. I mean, first of all, I should say that uh, democracy pro-democracy NGOs aren't always that useful. Um, you know, I've come across innumerable instances of projects that got USAID funds, not just in the Middle East, but all over the world in the former Soviet Union, that really, you know, were inappropriate, didn't fit, and so forth. The NGOs who were working in Egypt, what makes it so interesting um, to me is that it's not just a question of these US NGOs, it's a question of attitudes towards civil society and NGOs in general. And the desire by the Egyptian military ruling council, which really is in power, uh, and the uh, minister who brought, pushed for these charges, who's a Mubarak holdover, the only one in the cabinet, is as far as I can see, really to crush civil society, not so much about the Americans, but the Americans are the useful cover story for not only uh, raising the nationalist flag, but cracking down on the development of civil society as a whole. Um, but it does raise the question of how, if at all, U.S. pro-democracy groups can help. Because right now, um, as Marwan pointed out, I mean, there are all these different forces at play. And part of the question of dignity is a desire to prove that, you know, we don't need the help of the West. We are grown up now. We can do it ourselves. Um, the problem is that that would be wonderful. But what you see is that civil society is being crushed by the old order. The old order is still powerful. We have not, uh, it, to me, the division in the Middle East now is between the forces of the future and the forces of the past. And that cuts across leaders, that cuts across people. And right now, the staff is a force of the past, this minister is a force of the past, not because they're bringing this ridiculous trial against the American uh, um, NGO workers, who I am pretty confident having talked to them, were really just doing nuts and bolts teaching you how to do pro poll observation and so on, but because they are also eager to keep down Egyptian civil society because it questions what they are doing and their attempt to interfere with human rights. But the problem is that for the mass of the public who's looking for pride and dignity now, they can see any Western involvement as symptomatic of the old days, even if in reality, Western money is coming in mainly because Egyptian money is not permitted. NGOs are kept down by a draconian law, and liberal businessmen who might give to human rights NGOs, I was told by Egyptian businessmen, they're afraid to, because they are afraid that they will be harassed bitterly or even brutally by the remnants of the past. So I think the US has to step very, very carefully. I think that money, to any kind of democracy projects should uh, be funneled, if possible, through international organizations, through um, multilateral organizations, so that it just doesn't have the stamp of USA on it. And uh, you know, and I think it should be done very quietly, uh, not not um, covertly, but just without a lot of hoopla, um, and because. Uh, I don't think it's bad in principle, but I think it's bad if it reeks of an attempt by us at a very delicate moment in history to tell uh, people who are genuinely trying to bring change what to do. 
Sir. Do you see the military giving up power in Egypt in the near future or actually over the next couple decades? Um. Can you repeat the question? Yes. Uh, do, you, do you foresee the military giving up its power in the next decade or in the foreseeable future? Um, yes, I do. But you know, nowadays I'm not myself. I'm optimistic. So. <laughs> <laughs> Ask me anything. I'll say that. Uh, you know, standing on Tahrir Square uh, a couple of weeks ago, and listening to the slogans against uh, the head of the Supreme Council of Armed Forces, you know, we say this, if, if this is the tone, if, if this is as far as people can say to downgrade what is de facto the leaders of Egypt, that means this, this cannot go forward. I mean, speaking of dignity, I mean, they lost all dignity. Especially the, the so-called uh, the, the powerful 19, you know, the, the SCAF, the Supreme Council. They said they lost all uh, dignity because of the attacks on them continue and mount to the age. Now, that's as far as the mood in the country. But there is two caveats and they're important. Ones. One is that they are probably in the process of making a deal with the main bloc in Parliament, and that's the Muslim Brotherhood. And if they do succeed to do so, and they will do so because both parties need one another, meaning the Muslim Brotherhood found itself majority in Parliament and has absolutely not, no idea what to do. <laughs> I mean, you know, sometimes, what's, what do they say? You have to be careful what you wish for. Yeah. It might come through. But now they're stuck. Now they're not, they can't just be snotty in the opposition. Now everybody is snotty towards them. I mean, you know, that's first, first uh, session of parliament takes place and everyone's saying, so, what have you done for Egypt? <laughs> and they're looking around, you know, well, you just met. Uh, so in a sense, uh, the Brotherhood needs the military in order to share responsibility for the, for the upcoming failure. And the military needs the Brotherhood because they need some sort of popular support, especially by those who have an immediate problem. That might allow them more time, but limited. Because I think the expiration date uh, is approaching. Now, having said that, let me tell you what I said on Egyptian television, the, the most popular Egyptian television, and I really knew what I was saying and how I said it because I knew I was going to go to the airport. <laughs> <laughs> by the way, it's, it's, on, it's on the web. It's called Akhar Kalam, the last word. For an hour and a half, I was grilled on this and that. And I'm, I'm not that, I mean, I, I, I don't allow myself usually to speak that intimately about internal politics of each and every country, because no one should. But anyway, I just, and I, I, and I said the following, and I said that, as I said, not because I'm going to be snotty towards anyone, but I said the following. Egypt needs its military establishment. Let's not fool ourselves about that. Egypt needs its military establishment like the United States needs its military establishment. It is a power to be reckoned with. It will lose its sovereignty if it loses its military. So to talk about Egyptian military in kind of, uh, you know, uh, idealistic, uh, new, generic terms of the web does not work. At the end of the day, this is a very old institution. It's quite entrenched. And it has something to do in a region that is uh, in turmoil and war. Now, having said that, that does not mean that the Egyptian military needs to control 30% of the Egyptian economy, which it does, apparently. That means it shouldn't be controlling gas stations. It shouldn't be putting soldiers to work in farms that belongs to Germans, in some sort of a modern slavery. And this, by the way, were the allies of Washington for the last, what, 20 some years because of the campaign report and so on. That was all permissible. I think in the new Egypt is not going to be permissible. So I think it's going to be interesting for Egypt to find the balance. The balance is very simple. You respect, you maintain, you strengthen your military establishment as a sovereign country. At the same time, you get it out of politics, you get it out of the economy, and back into the barracks. And I think that's where we're heading probably in Egypt. 
course, not in the short term, perhaps in the intermediate and long term. Thank you. Sir, in the what's your life? opinion, both of your opinion, about the outcome in Syria? What's going to happen with the Syria? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Hey, what is your opinion about the likely outcome in Syria? Um, you know, I, I'd be a fool to, to make predictions here. I, there's certain things that one can say that are fairly obvious. <clears throat> the countries in the Middle East that will have the worst time are the countries who in, whose institutions were most destroyed by autocratic regimes. And that, sadly, is, uh, you know, Syria fits that bill. Not to the extent that Libya did. I mean, Libya really fits uh, the category of, uh, what does Tom Friedman say, tribes with flags. Um, I mean, Libya, ha uh, Qaddafi did not allow any state institutions, and you had all these regional and tribal differences. But Syria, Miskeen, um, Syria um, is a country that should have had a better education system, that had a business class that could have been encouraged to do real business, instead of cronyism living off the handouts of the regime. Uh, but Syria has basically been uh, turned into uh, a fief of um, the Assad family, I its relatives, and cronies. And, and you have the sectarian issue, of course. Uh, they belong to the minority Alawite sect, which is only 20%. And now that the nonviolent resistance, which offered the regime a chance to transition gracefully and get out with their lives and their Swiss bank accounts, now that that nonviolent resistance, which held out for a long time, has been brutally transformed into a violent resistance, which has very little uh, military means at its disposal, but now has a lot of scores to settle, now that all that is, has happened, it's hard to see how it will end well. And if the sectarian demon takes over in Syria, uh, it will be worse in some respects than in, in uh, Iraq. In Iraq, the two sides basically fought to a draw and the Americans helped broker a, a, a ceasefire. But in Syria, the minority is 10% and there's a huge amount of anger and this is gonna be brutal, but there is no, and I repeat, no organization on the side of the opposition because because it was wiped out, and it's a testament to how little organized opposition there is that you keep hearing the names of exiled former Syrian leaders raised, I mean, people who have no more credibility as leaders of Syria than I do. So, as I said when I, when I was last there, and granted it's a long time ago, but, uh, you know, from talking uh, to uh, people who know Syria, far away the permit of the night, I don't think things have changed that much. You have a situation where, although the Muslim Brotherhood was exiled, you had a lot of Islamist, under the table, semi-organization in mosques, because in Syria, many, many middle class people went to Saudi Arabia to teach, came back with Wahhabi ideology, I heard this over and over again when I was there in 2005 from liberals, from leftists who didn't want it to be so, but what they said is Assad prevented any organization except uh, the Islamists. And so uh, after a brutal civil war, which looks like it's in the cards, how you're going to form the new institutions, the new political class, uh, is a question that I certainly can't answer, and whether you will have any coherent body of Islamists who are capable uh, of looking to the future. I mean, we've just been discussing here in Egypt, you have a coherent body of Islamists, the Muslim Brotherhood, but they are still mired in the past. 
uh, you know, only in Tunisia do we have theoreticians who are looking forward. So what you're going to have in Syria when the bloodshed ends, um, it's very hard to predict. But you, yeah, I think it's easy to predict that it's going to be long, difficult, and unhappy. Other gentleman in the uh, glasses. My question is about Iran. If relations between the United States and its allies deteriorate to the point where Iran gets totally desperate and decides to close the Straits of Hormuz and put up our oil supply, do you think the, the United States and its allies should or will take direct military action to reopen the Straits? Um, I'm, um, I'm, I realize I speak on World Affairs Council here, so. I'll try to choose my words carefully. I am against any military intervention of any kind anywhere, except in self-defense. Self-defense. Self I mean, that's just my personal, my personal position. Now, let's do an analysis instead. Um, I find it, I find it troublesome how we are talking ourselves to war in that part. I mean, and that's when I say we, I mean we collectively, meaning uh, Iran, Israel, the United States, and its neighbors. It's, it's incredible after Iraq, the lessons of Iraq, how everyone, I mean, I, I mean everyone I know that with, with, with influence or with direct uh, role in this issue, whether it's mainstream media or uh, Al Quds Force and and, uh, and the and the Khamenei and Ahmadinejad, or Israel's Prime Minister and, and his Foreign Minister, or Saudi King, or you know, or some uh, a good number of Republicans and presidential candidates. I'm, I'm honestly, I'm, I, I, I mean, when when you look at it from the outside, it's really bizarre how everyone is talking themselves into war. If you start to decipher all of that, what you find is pompous Iranian leaders trying to do some populist game, swaggering through the Mediterranean with a fleet. What fleet? Two ships. <laughs> <laughs> Two ships. You can pick them with a drone, for God's sake. And you know, it's Obama's, of course, President Obama's new toy. There's lots of drones out in the Middle East. Two ships swaggering through the Suez Canal. And you know, when you're in the media and then you tweet and they tell you, Okay, they've approached Sana'a, they're up to the Red Sea, they've entered the Swiss Canal, they, they took a right. Two ships! I'm sure, I, I, I was wondering if they're actually going to make it to Syria. <laughs> Iran's, Iran's defense budget is 1% of America's defense budget. 1%. It's $7 billion, six and a half. Now they say, you know, it's not that, it's asymmetrical warfare. What does that mean, asymmetrical? Why would Iran want to draw America's wrath? I mean, look at Iran's history, including the Ayatollah's history. Iran has not invaded a country for the last century. More. Not attacked the country for the last century. More. The Ayatollahs were attacked by Saddam Hussein. They haven't even, you know, ventured out there. They supported Hezbollah, a bit of Hamas, you know, so-called proxy, this and that, to have some regional influence. At the same time, their, their north, their northern western neighbor and their southern eastern neighbor were occupied by the United States by an administration that said, we want regime change in Tehran. So here you have a country with extremist ayatollahs rule, ruling it. Its southern neighbor is occupied by the United States, its northern neighbor is occupied by the United States, and calling for a regime change in Iran. So they make noise. So they tell you, you know, we'll show you this and that, we're going to close the, the, you know, Hormones, if you do this, and etc. Et I think it's more hot air than anything else. And I think for a long time it's been more psychological warfare than anything else. But now, I no longer think so. I'm actually worried. I'm actually worried that everyone is going to talk themselves into war. And, and once they start closing hormones, this will not be war in any conventional way that we know of. That's the problem. I mean, the United States is going to have to attack every possible command center, military base, missile base, etc., etc., in Iran. And that's going to spill into Iraq, into the Gulf region, 
into Syria, Lebanon, and Israel, and so on and so forth. That means regional war. And Iran is not Iraq. And Iran has not been, 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 been uh, uh, kind of crippled with uh, 10 years of sanctions. It is able to respond in asymmetrical ways. And those, as I said, will not be tanks and airplanes. Those will mean sleeping cells, I don't know where, which part of the Gulf. It means oil prices are going to go skyrocketing. It means the economy is going to be crippled, not just here, not just in the, I mean, throughout the world. Recession is going to come back. And what for? Because everyone sp spoke everyone with their back to the wall. Because you cannot sit down and figure some simple questions like, okay, so there's this nuclear question, what do we do with it? What do you want in return? How do we can figure this out? What do you want to what do you want in the region? You want to be a power, small power, big power, medium power, you want what exactly you want guarantees, what guarantees do you want? Things that can be spoken. This we are sitting in a World Affairs Council and you I'm sure there's a good bunch of businessmen here and, and diplomats and we know how to do that. So why everyone is speaking themselves to war? After four thousand some killed and you know, American soldiers and, and tens of thousands of Iraqis and so much loss of you know, I'm gonna go on and on, so it's just all to say that I think if Iran does, which I don't think it will, but I think if it does, that means there's something severe happening, which I think would mean a regional war. And I think it would bode bad to everyone involved, the United States, Israel, the government. Yes. yes. As a businesswoman, you always mention businessmen, I want to ask each of you what your prediction is for the fate of women, the role of women in what we hope will be emerging democracies across the Arab world. Should I push you? Can you repeat that? Yes, that's uh, the question of women and the role of women and the future of women in. Uh, and by the way, I apologize. I think. Point well taken. Yeah. Business men and women, diplomats, gender, with Um You know, this is one of the most encouraging signs of the Arab revolution. There's absolutely no. Again, you know, as I told you earlier, I'm against military interventions. I'm also for women interventions. <laughs> and I think the fact that most of these early revolutions, especially in places like Tunisia, Egypt, Yemen, Bahrain, and so on, women played a central role. They played sometimes more than an equal role to the young men. I think that was a positive sign that things are going in the right direction. Because women in the Arab world, young and older women in the Arab world, uh, you know, had a doubled, I mean, suffered double or triple uh, than the men. Especially in societies where they did not exactly practice war, but even in those, they're the, they're the ones who ended up being with lost sons and lost husbands and so on and so forth, and having to take care of families and so on. And in the book, in my book, I have a chapter Subchapter that's headed, Where are the men? Because when women were at the forefront, not only in 2011, but before 2011, in the strikes leading to 2011 in Egypt, the textile industry was crippled by women striking, not men striking, by women nudging men, not vice versa. In Yemen, one of the most conservative countries in the Arab world, indeed in the world, women have been at the forefront of the revolution there. In Tunisia, a secular country, again, women were at the forefront. The problem is that although they were at the fore, they were not rewarded, and they have not been able, because of the old structures of the political parties, of the way that things are done, to, re to represent themselves or to, to make the same difference in whatever elections have taken place, in whatever post-revolutionary uh, Developments have taken place, but I think that's going to be a question. Of time. Can I can I say something? I'm much <coughs> I'm much more pessimistic. Um, I think that in Egypt, it's actually quite stunning how, despite the enormous presence of women in Tahrir Square, which we both saw, actually the number of women in the organizing council of the Tahrir Square demonstration was very limited. And subsequently, the elections were structured in such a way that although parties were required to put women on their list, they were not required, as in Tunisia, to put them 
high up on the list, and they all, especially the Muslim Brotherhood, put them <coughs> in such positions that they were guaranteed not to get elected. And in fact, I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, that there isn't one, or maybe there are one or two women in the entire elected lower house in these recent elections in Egypt, which is, is just stunning. I mean, it's worse than under Mubarak. That's number one. Number two, the Muslim Brotherhood is an organization that keeps women down. They have places in the organization, but their place is as wives and helpmeets. And they are not uh, allowed into positions of power. Uh, they are not allowed to play roles beyond their limited and circumscribed uh, uh, job descriptions. And uh, whether the Muslim Brotherhood, again, I think this is one of the most interesting questions for Egypt, whether they can look to the future the way the leadership of Anada has done, the way the leadership, with a lot of caveats, of AK Party in, in, in Turkey has done, although they are not great for women either, or whether they are going to keep women in their place and they are the most powerful political force, and then we haven't even come uh, to the Salafists who got 25% of the vote uh, in, in Egypt and whose idea of women's position is far, far, far uh, more destructive than the Muslim Brotherhood. And then in Tunisia, what we have yet to see is whether Enada will be able to control the Salafis there who didn't run in the elections, but who have draconian positions on, the, on women and seem willing to use intimidation and violence. They've already started in the universities. So uh, women that I know in Tunisia are frightened. Women that I know in Egypt are angry and unable to figure out how to get their foot in the door. And we haven't even come to the situation in Libya where religious forces have a very strong foothold, conservative religious, and we don't know what will come out in, in uh, Syria. So I am I'm very worried that women are actually going to be set back in Egypt because you have large numbers of educated middle class women, something that Egypt was famous for, Tunisia also, a secular society where women's rights were guaranteed fully in the 1950s. And uh, I just am hoping that women, despite their capacity and their education levels, in large parts of society in Tunisia and Egypt will not experience more repression than they have had in previous years. Okay, we have time for one more question, and I'd love to hear from one of the high school students. And there's a young lady in the back there. Please. Um, I was wondering, when you said you met the Facebook kids, you said that you thought young people had a voice, but they didn't really know how to organize their ideas to carry them forward. And you also mentioned that the past wouldn't be able to move Egypt towards the future. So who would you ideally think would be in charge of the country to bring forward what it is? I, I think, are you referring to something that yes. I, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. The question, the, the question is that, that I had said that um, young people were in the forefront of making the revolution, young educated people, but uh, the question is whether they'll really have a role in the future. Um, you know, one of the things that I, one of the things that makes me sad about the Egyptian revolution so far, and I totally agree that it's in flux, it's in movement, we don't know where it's headed, is that there is a substantial segment of educated young people who have ideas about the future. But it has been clearly revealed that either uh, their ideas don't resonate with the vast bulk of the population, or they haven't yet learned how to get those ideas out there. You know, many of these young people uh, come from the big cities. Uh, they've, uh, they've traveled abroad, if not lived abroad. Not all of them, but they don't have an easy familiarity with working class neighborhoods or with Upper Egypt or the Delta. Uh, the vast rural or poor urbanized areas, and they don't know how to talk to these people. And as a result, uh, liberal parties did very, or uh, non-Islamist parties did very poorly because the Islamist parties know how to talk to these people. They are from these people, and they have dealt with them 
year in, year out in the mosque in charitable organizations. So these young people with ideas, I mean, some of them are still optimistic, they're hopeful. They will have to learn how to reach out, how to ally with others. There are, for example, young Muslim brothers who broke from their organization because they feel that it is too rigid, too backward looking. And, you know, we will see, I think that these young people have a message that could resonate, but they don't know how to get that message out, especially when state television is the main vehicle by which most Egyptians still get their news and understanding, and it is totally under the thumb still of backward-looking forces, the military, um, uh, the, uh, uh, people who are leftovers from the past. So uh, we don't know, um, and, and it will be one of the most interesting questions to watch, I think, in the future. Mm -hmm. Want to add to that? Um, I can't leave you with uh, too this pessimism. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, uh, uh, there was uh, one Palestinian, speaking paradoxes, right? One Palestinian novelist who won Israel's best author award, Live it to your imagination. Uh, he wrote a book uh, by the name of Said the Ill Fated Bizoptimist. Said means happy, ill fated, everyone knows what that means. Bizoptimist, as in pessimist optimist. And the, the main line of the story, if you will, that in that part of the world, People are pessimist because they always have a feeling that good news bring with it bad news. <laughs> always bring good news are pregnant with bad news. That in the Middle East reality, the bitter reality, is always against an optimistic people by nature. And hence, we live, continue to live that pessimist reality. I just have a feeling that perhaps we have broken away from the result of this reality. That not all, good new, not, not all good news are pregnant with bad news. And as I said earlier, if you take in consideration that 70% of the Arab world is under the age of 30, that means all these backward looking, conservative this and that and the other thing, are going to, you know, God be with them, move on pretty soon and a new generation is coming to take form and that generation is the revolution generation that is the miracle generation and like it or not for, or for the generals or for the muslim brotherhood leaders to like it or not and they're all by the way over and no disrespect of course i am of that generation but you know they're all in retirement age let's just put it that way. and i think it is time to leave the, uh, the field for the younger generation. And I have hope that a younger generation of men and women, even though they keep being pushed back, even though they keep pushed, being pushed under, that against all odds they rise. There, it's no news that women have been kept down in the Arab world, like they've been kept down in many other parts of the world. Right? It's not news. What's news is that they have revolted against them. What's news is they have been leading demonstrations. What's news is that they are supported by their families as they lead demonstrations. That they have been going to prisons. What's new is that they are and they have a new discourse that stands head to head. What also is new is that despite the attempts to keep them down and to keep them out of parliament, they continue today in the public squares of the Arab world to struggle for their rights. I am optimistic as long as I see people moving on, struggling, fighting for their rights, fighting for democracy, fighting for freedom. Because it's not gonna be parachuted from the sky, it's not gonna come an American tank. You all know that by now. It's gonna have to come from within. And if there has ever been hope, if there has ever been hope, and, and, and in my lifetime there hasn't been, it is not, it is time. And in a sense, and I'll, you know, I'll repeat a cliche, this is the generation we've been waiting for. So I think we're going to have to give them a chance. It's going to be difficult. At times it's going to be really dark. 
And it's going to be dark winter, not spring. Yes, I, I, I give you that. And it might take longer. And it's not going to happen without economic progress and finding jobs and bread. I give you that. But who said there was a set date for all of this to happen? There's been an evolution to the revolution, and there's going to be an evolution after the revolution. And that's the fun ride. This is the roller coaster that everyone needs to get onto. That's called life. And I enjoy it, and I think they will. And I thank you. <clears throat> Uh, thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, we have Mr. Bashar's book, The Invisible Arab, for sale, and he'll be staying a while.